Go ahead. Now done. So welcome everyone um, to uh, our weekly call. Um, we've got an interesting uh, session today, which I for one have certainly been looking forward to. Um, uh, where our main focus for the today is going to be um, uh, just reprising a, what I thought was a very interesting presentation uh, that uh, Kevin Bock gave uh, at the IRTF open session. Uh, during uh, ITF 112 to, uh, uh, a few weeks back on server-side evasion of filtering, uh, which... Um, you, sh you should go generally. I'm pretty sure. Well, I mean, my humble opinion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, th I think it's going to be an inter interesting, interesting presentation for many, particularly uh, those of you that have... Uh, uh, uh any stakes in in content filtering um and this is stuff that you'll need to to know about uh, uh, and understand um so we'll, we'll we'll kick off with that and then if time permits at the end after we've had sort of the uh, kim's presentation and uh discussion um then we'll pick up on a few other points but uh the, the main emphasis for today will be uh, uh just just working through uh, the uh, sort of presentation and any questions that people may have uh, so, Kevin, um, do you want to uh, just check? You're able to share your your screen. Yeah, let's see if this works. Everybody see this? Yeah, perfect. All righty, and you can still see it, and you can hear me. Yeah, it's all good, Kevin. Beautiful, beautiful. And I'm sorry, Andrew, you've already seen this. <laughs> it will still be interesting. So don't. don't... <laughs> <clears throat> Am I good to go? Do you have other announcements? I don't yeah, want to yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, far away. And uh, what I suggest is if people got any points of clarification as, as you run through, Kevin, then uh, please raise your, your hand using the Zoom tool or put questions in chat. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll take some general questions and comments uh, at, at the end of the presentation. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm, I'm totally cool with people raising their hands or taking questions during it. Keep a little more conversational, a little less just me talking into the void. So all those are good things. <laughs> um, yeah, so overall, my name is Kevin Bach. I'm from the University of Maryland. I'm a PhD candidate there. Uh, but I did also just want to, before I get started, thank Andrew for having me. I've enjoyed the last few talks, and it's cool to be here with you guys. But today I'm going to be talking about a project we worked on uh, this, past, uh, this past year. We've been working on it for a little while. Um, and this is this idea of this new form of censorship evasion we've been working on, which is defeating censorship from the server side of connections. Uh, before I jump into that, I wanted to give you all just a quick run through of what a lot of nation state censorship looks like today and sort of motivate some of the approaches that we took. So there are many types of censorship that operate around the world today. Specifically, the kind that I'm gonna be talking about is this automated censorship that operates in the network by nation states. Okay, now some nation states operate censorship as these sort of in-path sensors like this, where the sensor sits physically in the network path. There's other sensors though that operate sensors instead like this. They're not in the path, they're on the path. And although this looks like a small distinction, that it has some impact in how censorship is performed. So in this case, if a client makes a forbidden request, and here's our, here's our little request, and the request will move through the network, you'll notice that even if this request is forbidden by the sensor, the server will still get the packet. The sensor will too, the sensor will just get a copy of it. Since the sensor is seeing a copy of it, if the sensor wants to censor the connection, it can't drop it because it's not in the path. So instead what it does is it performs deep packet inspection. It's like, whoa, this is, this is not allowed by my policy. And what it does to take down this connection or to censor this connection is it can inject its own packets into the connection. And specifically, it'll inject spoofed TCP reset or teardown packets. Uh, these are normal packets our computers send these all the time and they exist just to tell the other side, stop talking to me. All right, it's gonna send two of these, one to the client pretending to be the server and one to the server pretending to be the client. Now, when these packets arrive, the client sees this and it's like, oh, look at that. The server just terminated my connection. I should stop talking now. And the server sees this packet and says, well, I guess the client wants to stop talking to me. The connection's terminated. Both sides immediately stop talking to each other. And just like that, censorship has been achieved. But you'll notice though, that in order to pull off this attack, the sensor needs to have some information about the connection itself, right? It needs to know the port numbers. It needs to know the sequence number, the acknowledgement number. It needs per flow state, okay? And what this means is that to be an effective sensor, you need to be tracking the state of every TCP connection coming into and out of your country at all times. 
And that's actually a pretty mammoth engineering effort for a country so like the size of China, right? So along the way, the sensors may end up taking shortcuts to accomplish this. And us as evaders could take advantage of these shortcuts. Now I say take shortcuts here a little hand wavy. There's actually a little more um, fundamental uh, issue the sensor is contending with here called uh, the eavesdropper's dilemma. Um, this states that from the middle of the connection, it's difficult to accurately model the states at the ends of the connection. Um, so that's just a, a fundamental difficulty in network architecture. Um, and I can talk about more at the end if people are curious. But let me show you an example from prior work of how people had, uh, researchers had come up with a way to take advantage of a shortcut in sensors like this to evade censorship. Okay. Once again, our intrepid client let's say in China is gonna try and reach some forbidden resource. But before we send our, our forbidden request, the client is going to inject our own TCP reset packet. We're gonna send it in such a way that we set the TTL of the packet, the time to live, high enough to reach the sensor, but not high enough to reach the server. So when we send this packet through, just like before, the sensor will get a copy of the packet. But if you notice the server won't, right? It'll get dropped along the way. Now at this point, the sensor sees this packet and it's like, oh, it looks like the client just terminated its connection. The sensor is super state constrained, right? So it says, I can stop tracking this connection now. And it throws away the state it's been maintaining about this connection. At this point, the server has no idea we pulled off this trick. The sensor has no state with which to censor us even if it wanted to. So for the rest of this flow, the client and server can communicate censorship free. Now, this is one example of dozens of these strategies that have been developed by hand over the last 10 years. And one thing that all of these have in common and what just about all prior approaches to censorship evasion or content filtering evasion have in common is that evasion has always involved the client. And that sounds like such an obvious statement to say out loud that it's like almost axiomatic, right? Um, like if the client wants to evade censorship, the client should have to do something, right? It's just like so silly to say out loud. But if you think about this, this, this idea has always posed a significant barrier to deployment. And this goes for even beyond um, the clever techniques like this, like if you want to use Tor or VPN or proxy, right? In all these cases, the client is doing something, even if it's they're just configuring something, the client is taking some action. And this, this requirement of the client taking action has always posed this barrier to deployment. Uh, in many cases, installing the software can pose some risk to the user. And beyond this, it can help users who either don't have the technical know-how to deploy these things, or who have no idea they're being censored in the first place. Now, ideally, it would be great if servers could help. So under this model, instead of deploying software at the client, instead we deploy it at the server. And the server would subvert censorship on the user's behalf without the client needing to deploy anything at all. And this is a kind of a cool idea, right? This immediately broadens reachability and accessibility. Many clients connect to one server, right? None of them needs to do anything. All users get plausible deniability and it immediately uncensors all the users who don't know they're being censored in the first place or who don't have the technical know how to set these things up. Now, unfortunately, like a lot of great ideas, it shouldn't be possible and that's always a bummer. And to see why this is and why we thought this, um, consider the waterfall diagram of packets that are exchanged leading up to uh, the client sending a censored keyword, okay? This is, this is a, a diagram of the sequence of packets in a client server. Just pretend there's a sensor sitting in the middle. The client starts with a through a handshake. We have our sin, sin, ack, ack, and then the censored keyword comes in. And you'll notice looking at this that the only thing that a server does before a client is censored is it sends the sin ack packet. And this is really the only thing the server can do. It can't influence the connection at all once it sends this packet. And it has no influence on the connection before this packet because it can't control when the client sends the sin. So because there's so that's such a tiny window for the server to do anything, it was largely considered that this was not a possible thing. And underscoring the difficulty in this space, there had been no prior work on this, innovating censorship from the server. Now, in this work, I'm excited to tell you that server-side evasion is indeed possible. I guess I wouldn't be standing here talking to you all if it wasn't. Uh, so in the rest of this talk, I'm gonna talk about how we discovered these server-side techniques, um, the results across multiple different countries and protocols where we tested these. And once we have these techniques, uh, some of the new insights we can glean from sensors using them. Now, before I dive into this, I wanna give you a little bit of background on a tool that we used and modified to find these strategies, okay? And that tool is Geneva. So Geneva is an open source client-side tool. It's available on our website and I'll link to it at the very end of this talk. And its, it's original goal was to automatically discover censorship evasion strategies from the client side, okay? This was originally designed by my team back in 2019. And the way it works is it runs strictly on one side of the connection. It was originally built for client side, hence this diagram. 
and it manipulates packets as it enters and leaves, as they enter and leave. The mechanisms in which it can manipulate packets, it's constrained to just four actions. Okay, these are the only four things it's allowed to do. It can duplicate packets. It can tamper packets, which is take a packet and change some header fields. It can fragment a packet, take one packet and break into two packets, or drop the packet, which is exactly what it sounds like. I'm gonna call out two things specifically here about these actions. Um, first thing, tamper, we allow it to alter or corrupt any TCP IP header fields. But importantly, we don't give it any semantic understanding as to what these fields mean. Okay, so that means that it sees the TCP flags field as something it can change, but it has no knowledge that if I change the flags field to sin, that means the start of a connection. So syntax, but no semantics. I'll also call it fragment here. Fragment does a bit of double duty. Uh, fragment at the IP layer does fragmentation. At the TCP layer, it does segmentation. So these are the four things that Geneva can do together. And Geneva, I, I did... I, I uh, neglected to mention this previously, but it, it is a genetic algorithm and it composes these actions together and then evolves these strategies over time directly against the live adversary. So you can see that these, these actions can compose together and Geneva composes these together into trees. So this is an example of what a uh, service, a uh, censorship evasion strategy looks like in Geneva. Okay, it's, it's a tree and it's two components to this tree. There's a match, some trigger, and then an action system. So the match in this case is outbound TCP flags equal to ACK. So Geneva is monitoring all the packets coming in and out of the client. And if it sees something that matches a trigger, it pulls that packet into the tree. The tree describes how the, how the packet should be modified. So the first action is duplicate. We take one packet, we make two packets. We're done with the left child, there's nothing else to do. The right child, we tamper the TCP flags field to reset, the IP TTL to two, and then when it's done, it does an in-order traverse of the leaves and sends the packets. And so you're not just keeping all this in your head. Well, let's see an example of this. Once again, our intrepid client is going to try and make a communication to the server, but this time it has the strategy to help. So since it's about to finish this through a handshake, it's about to send an ACK. And Geneva will see that this ACK matches this active strategy. It pulls it in, do the duplication, the tamper, the tamper. And then, as I mentioned, in-order traverse of the leaves, and we send these. And what you'll notice we just did here is that this tree exactly implements the server-side evasion strategy that I, the client-side evasion strategy that I opened this talk with, right? This is a TTL limited reset attack. This idea is that we, were, we are able to capture all of these prior work uh, strategies and implement them in these trees like this. And this is something that an algorithm can start to play with and modify and discover these things automatically. Oh boy, we got a whiteboard setup going on. This is exciting. Can I draw a smiley face? So for this work, what we did was we took Geneva and we modified it to run on the server side. And we deployed it against real world sensors. Uh, in previous work, and in many other cases like this, uh, we've tended to focus on HTTP. So for this work, we also broaden the protocols we try and subvert censorship for. So specifically we talk, uh, we, we look into a diversity of network protocols, uh, HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, FTP, and SMTP. Uh, and yes, all of these protocols are censored in various regions of the world. Um, for these four, this is largely triggering censorship for these. It's, it's largely about making requests or queries with forbidden keywords or domains. Uh, SMTP is actually a bit of a weird case. Um, this is censored in China. Um, but as far as we know, there's only one email address that's reliably censored. It's this email address. Um, for context, this email address is how uh, bridge nodes used to be distributed. Uh, so the Great Firewall has this capability specifically to target um, emails going to and from this email address. And to show how this technique could be applied broadly, in addition to a diversity of protocols, we also looked at a diversity of sensors, uh, both around the world and how those sensors are implemented. So for this work specifically, we looked at China, uh, Iran, Kazakhstan, and India. And these sensors all operate in slightly different ways. You'll notice on the slide, there's a small asterisk. I'll just mention what this is here. Um, by the time we did these experiments, um, Iran has DNS over TCP censorship. It's been observed in the past, um, but for reasons unknown, it's been deactivated for the last several years. So uh, it's not, we weren't able to test that from our vantage points. So let me, let me walk you through what some of these results are. And recall that server-side evasion really shouldn't work in any of these cases, because um, the server can't influence the connection past the SYNAC. Um, but Geneva was able to find strategies. And here's one of them. Here's what one of these look like. Uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, this is one that works in China. Um, so I wanna, I wanna break down what's going on here. So at the start of the connection, the client sends a SYN, like the client always does, because the client has no choice. 
But the server doesn't respond with the SYNAC anymore. It responds with a SYN packet itself. Now this apparently is legal. Uh, the, this uh, is taking advantage of an archaic feature of TCP called TCP simultaneous open. Uh, this is something that was built into the original TCP RFC to handle the edge case in which two computers send a SYN packet to each other at the exact same time. Okay. Now, once we send the SYN packet, we send a second pin SYN packet, this time containing a payload that is also legal because this is how SYN cookies are implemented. And when the client receives the SYN packet from the sensor, the client sends a SYNAC. This is just the default behavior of the TCP stack and the TCP stack on all of the computers you're all, you're all running and listening to this talk on. And it's actually to the sensor, the combination of the client sending a SYNAC immediately preceded by a SYN packet containing a payload that causes the Great Firewall of China to desynchronize from this connection. Now, we believe this is actually an off by one bug in the Great Firewall. Uh, it's, it fails to properly increment the ISNs during this uh, wacky modified handshake. And as crazy as this looks, this actually works across all of the protocols we tested with a variety of success rates. For context, if you do nothing at all, the baseline uh, success strategy rate is around 2%. This is one successful strategy, but it's actually one of many. And altogether, we found 11 different strategies in our original paper. Uh, we found eight in China, uh, one in India and Iran, and three in Kazakhstan. Now, the paper goes into detail on in all of these. And as much as I'd love to, I do not have time to go through all of them. But I would love to show you just a few more, because I, I do think these are fun. Um, the next one takes place in Kazakhstan. And we call this one null TCP flags. And this one is, is much more straightforward than the previous one. Client sends us in, as always. But the server responds with a packet with no TCP flag set at all. And this packet shouldn't exist, right? It, it literally has no meaning in TCP. And the client will just dutifully drop it because it's a meaningless packet. But the sensor sees this and the sensor's like, wow, there's something really strange going on in this, in this connection. I must have missed something or parsed something wrong. And it just stops paying attention to the connection. And just like that, client and server can now communicate censorship free. At the time, this worked 100% of the time over HTTP in Kazakhstan. Another big takeaway for this, for this one specifically, is this really helps motivate why we should be using automated techniques to discover this, right? This is honestly probably a bug in the sensor, and it might have been difficult for a human to discover these. So this is, this is one of those reasons where it can be powerful to have some sort of automated way to search through this space. This next, I want to, next one I want to talk about, instead of, once again, client search with the SYN, in response, instead of sending one SYNAC, the server sends two. And included on each SYNAC, it includes a payload of a well-formed HTTP GET request for some innocuous domain. Now, including a payload here is technically legal, right? But the client will see this and will just ignore the payload because the payload shouldn't be there in this connection. But the sensor will see these payloads and will parse them as valid HTTP, valid HTTP requests at that. So when the sensor sees these, it's like, wow, I just saw two requests coming from what I thought was the server. I must have the connection direction wrong. That's got to be the client because the server would never do this. And it reverses in the mind of the sensor the roles of client and server. And because the sensor processes packets differently depending on which side of the connection it's looking at, when the client goes ahead and makes its real forbidden request, it will go through fine. And the client will uh, be free of censorship for the rest of this connection. This also worked with 100% reliability in Kazakhstan. So at this point, there's, we've seen all sorts of different types of bugs in these sensors. Uh, these, everything from not handling esoteric features in TCP correctly, um, error edge cases, uh, uh, confusing the logic of these things altogether. Uh, for more details, I'll refer you to the paper. Uh, but I want to note that none of these require any client changes, deployment, configuration, or any client behavior at all. Now, many of these strategies will induce client behavior, but there's no software changes that are needed to the client. And to show that this is broadly applicable, we also tested this across a wide, diverse range of clients. Um, every client on this, on this page, every, every one of these operating systems or network stacks, I should say, uh, we confirmed that they respond properly to all of these strategies. We actually only found one case of a strategy that relied on some uh, platform-dependent behavior, and we were able to very easily rewrite that to make it platform agnostic. You could imagine in the future updating the automated system to take into, take into account multiple different end hosts, and that problem just won't exist. Now, all these strategies teach us some things about how sensors work. And now that we have these new capabilities, we've been able to dig more into how sensors are in implemented 
and deployed around the world. I want to talk about two of these new insights that this has provided. If there's any questions, by the way, anyone can just really jump in. The first thing I'm going to talk about is something called the resynchronization state. Okay, this is a feature of the Great Firewall, you know, the Great Firewall of China, that allows it to be more tolerant to packet loss. Okay, so specifically the way this works, that if the sensor misses some packet for whatever reason, it can resynchronize on a later packet in the connection. Now, the exact dynamics of the resynchronization state are constantly evolving over time. But understanding how that resynchronization state operates allows us to build better censorship evasion tools. And this also gives us new insight as to why that first strategy I showed you, why that, that first uh, simultaneous open based desynchronization strategy, why that works. So once again, here's this crazy strategy. Now I'm gonna focus specifically on that second SYN packet sent by the server. Okay, this is that weird SYN that contained a payload. Now the payload from that server actually triggers the great firewall to resynchronize. That, that payload on a SYN uh, kicks into the great firewall's resynchronization state. What this means is it forces the great firewall to resynchronize on the next packet in the connection, which is the SYN act from the client. But because it's resynchronizing, it forgets that it's inside the handshake. And when that happens, it doesn't properly increment the, inter the uh, initial sequence number anymore. And what this means is this is an off by one bug in the Great Firewall. This is an example of how, by studying the resynchronization state, we can improve and make better use of these strategies. And again, these worked. Um, this strategy works for all these protocols. And in fact, we discovered something else strange: with that the Great Firewall resynchronizes differently depending on the protocol itself. Um, so this is some additional details in the dynamics of the resynchronization state that we discovered in this paper. And I'm not going to go through all of it because it gets a little in the weeds and at the end of the day, it's not super important. Um, this is just another example of protocol variability and how we can learn from sensors by studying these. And the next thing that I wanted to talk about in this idea of learning from sensors is something we noticed while we were looking at the success rates of our strategies in China. Okay. You'll notice that all of the server-side strategies I've talked about throughout this entire talk, they operate strictly during the TCP theory handshake, right? Which means that there has been no application layer data exchanged yet. But what we noticed looking at the success rates, and you may have noticed this actually when I popped the success rates up on the slides, was that different applications were affected differently in China. This wasn't, well, this wasn't the case in any other country, but in China, they were affected differently. And this makes sense at first, but if you think about it a little more, it, it makes a little less sense, right? Because since we're operating strictly during the three-way handshake, there's no application layer data. So the sensor shouldn't know what protocol we're talking at. And you may be thinking, well, it's just ports. The Great Firewall sensors all of these protocols across any port. So it's not using port. So what's going on here? What this has led to is us conceptualizing really a new model for how the, how the Great Firewall of China looks like. Because Tacitly, we kind of assumed that the Great Firewall in the past had this sort of same uh, network model uh, that we expect to see in other places where you sanely separate the application layer from the transport layer protocols. But what we're finding here is that there are different TCP layer bugs per protocol. What this means is that each protocol must have its own TCP IP stack, which means that apparently what's happening it looks a little something like this, right? And what this result suggests is that the Great Firewall is actually running multiple sensor middle boxes in parallel. They're not just using one system, it's many working in tandem. And this is this like idea of a multi-box theory, there's multiple middle boxes together that are powering the Great Firewall. So really my simplistic example from the start, this, uh, this beautiful PowerPoint diagram, right? It doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks a little more like this. And this begs the question, which I kind of alluded to a moment ago, which is how does it know which middle box to apply to a connection, right? When our intrepid client goes ahead and it sends its packets through, how does it know which is going to? And like I said, it's not port number. That would be an easy solution, but it censors all these protocols effectively in any port. If you host an HTTP server on port 53, the Great Firewall will catch you. So it's not using port number. And in answer to this question of how does it know which middle box to apply, we think the answer is that it doesn't, and that every middle box gets a copy of every packet Every middle box is tracking every connection independently. And then every middle box applies protocol fingerprinting to try to determine if that packet belongs to it. And it'll go around and all these will see, hey, is this something I could censor? Is this something I could censor? Maybe yes, maybe no. And then one of them says, this is mine. And it takes action. 
And what's interesting about this is that this also answers another long-standing question in censorship evasion, which is why doesn't the Great Firewall fail closed? Right? We, we take away its state in order to censor something. You kind of wonder like, okay, it doesn't have state. Why doesn't it just kill the connection by default? And the reason we think it can't just kill connections by default is because all these different machines are running in parallel. There will always be some machine, or actually there will always be most of the machines that can't take action against the thing. And if you turn all of them to be fail closed, all of them will kill the, kill the other one's protocols. So this kind of explains why the Great Firewall has been a fail open system for so long, despite researchers finding longstanding techniques like the ones I'm describing. This also raises the question of where are these guys? Are they near each other? Are they far away? So we use TTL limited probes. We, we sent forbidden queries with increasing TTLs to figure out where do these BACAs respond? And as far as we can tell, they seem to be co-located at the network level. This is another example of um, some new insights we've been able to, to peer into the black box of censorship and learn, learn more about how they're implemented and how they're deployed. Now next, I wanna talk about where we've taken these ideas since this paper and, and where we've gone from here. So the first thing I wanna talk about is how uh, Geneva and tools like this have allowed us to be highly responsive to new forms of censorship as they come out. So in February of last year, Iran, uh, ahead of their parliamentary elections, quietly launched a new censorship system entirely. This is a protocol, thing, protocol filter. And the way this thing works is it looks at all network traffic, leaving the country on certain ports. And any network traffic that doesn't explicitly match an allowed protocol, it will censor, even if what you're doing is innocuous. And what this does in effect is it forces the citizens of the country to use only the protocols that their standard censorship system can censor. This is an allow list system. We actually, we were actually the ones who discovered this system. We had been training Geneva and Iran at the time and some strategies that worked the previous week were no longer working the next week. And digging into what was going on is that Geneva had accidentally violated some of these protocol fingerprints. And so we spent some time with Geneva and we were able to reverse engineer these fingerprints. But more importantly, within 24 hours after deploying Geneva against the system, we discovered four strategies to evade this, some from the client, some from the server. And this ability to Iran deploys a new censorship system within 24 hours, we've waited to feed it. That's a really powerful way to respond to uh, these, these new rollouts of censorship. <clears throat> I'll talk about one more example of this. Uh, in July of last year, um, China began censoring the use of encrypted SNI uh, and, TLS, and TLS up to 1.2, and I guess it's still parts of 1.3. Um, there's this SNI field, server name indication. Now, this is a field of the uh, TLS client hello. And it's basically the only plain text field in there. But when you start a TLS connection to some resource, the domain at which you're talking to is included in plain text in that field. And that plain text field is actually how sensors around the world have been censoring HTTPS um, this whole time. They just look at that domain. If it's forbidden, they take the connection down. There's a new extension to TLS, well, newish, I should say, it's not that new, called encrypted SNI. And its job is basically encrypt that field. And many in the censorship community had really been looking forward to the rollout of ESNI, because the idea was it would just protect all of HTTPS. China took a very firm stance against this last summer and basically just made the blanket statement that anyone who uses ESNI, even if what you're doing is innocuous, you'll be censored. And China effectively killed the rollout of ESNI within the country overnight. We, put, we trained Geneva against this specific system, this encrypted SNI system. And within 24 hours, we had discovered six strategies to evade the SNI censorship. There's actually a full blog post up on our website still uh, about how we did this and about how those strategies work, if you're curious. But again, this idea that within 24 hours of the nation state rolling out new infrastructure, that we can have ways around it, very powerful way to respond. The other exciting direction we've been able to explore since this work is a real world deployment of this system. We've been working with a number of anti-censorship groups around the world to integrate our software and findings into their system. Uh, two that I can talk about today are Siphon. Uh, this is a popular anti-censorship tool, specifically in China, and also TunnelBear. This is a, a, VPN, a VPN service. And these have been integrating, integrating Geneva. And interestingly, they've been integrating it for different reasons. Uh, Siphon is pretty confident in getting users connected to their network, but they want to protect those encrypted comms once they're there. They want the sensor to stop harassing their protected communications. They can use Geneva to help harden these existing evasion protocols. Tunnel bear in some countries, the main weakness right now is getting clients initially connected to that initial connection point. So with Geneva's help, we can help them bootstrap those connections. There's many different uses for these server-side techniques. 
but we're starting to see these getting used in the wild, which is very exciting. I really wanna conclude here, just speaking more broadly about new directions that this work and other recent works we've been working on, that these open to us. Because really at the end of the day, all of these sensors that I'm talking about, these are all just middle boxes. And middle boxes have grown increasingly complex and their deployments have grown increasingly complex. And they're creating new possibilities for research and for attacks in the network that we really should be studying. It's also started to change how we conceptualize middle boxes. Um, the good of these is that it's opening up censorship invasion to more people, right? Even those who don't know they're being censored. This is made possible though by the ugly fact that middle boxes have these exploitable bugs or assumptions that many of them just incur or haven't tested. Unfortunately, this can also lead to some very bad directions. And another more recent piece of work, we actually showed that middle boxes around the world, even innocuous firewalls protecting us here in the US or in Poland or anywhere you may be, um, these can be weaponized to launch attacks at other people, innocent hosts anywhere on the internet. And this was published earlier this year in Usenix. And I believe Andrew linked to this work because I thought it might be of uh, interest to you guys and the email. So you can check that out as well. But ultimately, to really make sense of what, what these middle boxes are doing and, and changing in the network, we really need more automated tools like Geneva and future versions uh, to really understand the, how the landscape is changing with the advent of more middle boxes. So I'm going to wrap up here and conclude. I think I'm a little over half hour. I'll, I'll end it right here. Um, but our, our website is up on the, up on the slide, geneva.csdmd.edu. I'm happy to take questions and thanks so much for listening. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Kevin. And it's, it's good to uh, uh, have you go through that, but with a bit more time than you had during the IRTF session. Yeah. Uh, which I think was beneficial. Uh, let me kick off with a uh, uh, maybe an opening question, which is sort of semi reprise what I asked you uh, during the IRTF. IRTF open, if I can say it properly, um, which is uh, for, let's say, more benign uh, sort of content filtering uses. Um, uh, the, I'm, I'm assuming that, that, that this will work equally effectively, if that's the right word, say, in an enterprise uh, sort of content filtering, uh, filtering scenario, um, or um, on the, perhaps the more negative side, um, could have interesting implications, let's say, um, for uh, malware that's trying to uh, evade um, content filtering. Any thoughts on that, on those two? And then we see what, what other questions anyone may have. Yeah, definitely. And I, I remember our, our, our discussion at IRTF, and this is really a question we get a lot of, um, hey, you've developed this tool, and just like all tools, it could be used for good and evil. And the, the evil side is it's not very difficult to conceptualize. Like, really, you can look at these slides, and it's like one of the first things that come to mind of like, hey, I like my firewall that keeps malware out of my system. Like, what are you doing? Um, so, I mean, it, it really is a good point. And at the end of the day, I, I, of course, cannot say for sure that this can't be used for malware. I'm sure it can. Um, there are some aspects of it that I think are a little better suited to the censorship evasion case than the malware case or an enterprise system case. Um, there are just like certain properties of sensors that are slightly different than regular firewalls that I think make it slightly harder to apply to those scenarios, but obviously not impossible. Um, so we, we think by releasing this that the, the net good uh, exceeded the net bad. And so that's why we went down that route. But um, that ethics discussion was, it was a difficult thing that we wrestled with for weeks and months before we open sourced this or even made this public. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great stuff. It's a great thought. And it's, um, it's something we revisit time to time for sure. Yeah. And I'm hoping that some of the, some of the guys on the call that are involved in content filtering might want to sort of, sort of chime in with it, with their thoughts on that because they'd be more well informed than I am. But I can see um, John and Mark have both got their hands raised. So to John, then Mark, you want to come in? Thanks. Uh, yeah, very interesting presentation. Um, uh, I'm going to skip Andrew's comment until the, as a next follow up. But uh, my question would be, have you seen reaction to this, meaning that after the publication or the first publication of your findings, have you measured any changes in any of these systems based on your discovery? And if not, or is that part of your next research to see how long it takes for them to react? So the answer to your question is yes and yes. Um, it is it is something we, we desperately want to study. What is when a sensor publishes a patch, what does that look like? Like, I mean, patching patching enterprise systems is diff difficult. Like imagine doing it at the scale of a country, right? Understanding that would be very interesting. Um, have we seen updates? The answer is yes. Um, one or two of these strategies, I mentioned this talk actually, I think Kazakhstan has actually been most active in, in patching our stuff. Um, this null flags, for example, uh, this was patched 
like a year ago or so, or six months. Um, and it may also be the case that this one was also patched not too long ago. So we know they've read our paper and we, we know these techniques are out there and we know they're aware of them. Um, some of them, actually a bunch of them still have not been patched. And some of them we think are actually pretty difficult to patch. Um, I didn't really get into it much in this talk, uh, but the strategies Geneva finds really broadly fall into two big classes. There's the bugs and implementation, like the silly things, like the one-off bug or, um, oh my God, no flags. Like these things that are probably just someone screwed up, right? But the second class is really these bigger uh, systemic design flaws. These like, we didn't architect this in a way that can handle this idea. Um, so for example, one of, the, one of these strategies that I did not go into on these slides um, is this idea that a, a server can force the client to segment their traffic arbitrarily small. And there's some of these sensors that aren't keeping track of enough state to reassemble these packets, right? That's not a bug. That's like a completely missing thing. They just, they just never implemented. And the idea that a server can just force the client to do that, now they're through. So we think what's gonna happen as time goes on is the bugs will die fairly quickly, but these other bigger things are gonna be much harder to patch. And that's kind of how what's, what started to play out is some of these have gone away quickly and some of these have been really longstanding. It'll be interesting to see how, they, how it continues to evolve if they Maybe they dump more money into it. Maybe they don't. We'll okay. see. Thanks. Th thanks for your answer. That actually t ties into Andrew's, uh, I guess, follow-on question. Uh, speaking kind of as a content or as a as a malware filtering service, I, I don't. And of course, I don't have a lot of insight into how people um, apply this or apply firewalls to the enterprise space. But it seems to me most enterprise firewalls are stateful, um, or or that they they have much more state capability than this. And censorship is a kind of a different animal at scale. Um, but I will say that um, th this will be interesting to see if this research and these bugs ultimately force um, nations into a more complete state concept, uh, stateful concept for censorship. And uh, I think that's a, a, not, a not an encouraging <laughs> uh, horizon to look at. Yep. Yeah, you, I mean, you point to a very real difference of the amount of state that a... Uh a small enterprise network can maintain is, is a much different animal than um, something a country can maintain. Okay, thanks, John. Um, Mark. Oh, hi, this is Mark, great presentation. <laughs> uh, John asked my first question, you know, um, are they fixing off by one bugs in response to your, your paper? So, uh, but my second question was just something that you said, and maybe I was confused. You said something like, then we went to Iran. So is this testing, is any of this testing happening from inside the firewall or is this all outside in? All of this testing is from inside these firewalls, actually. So you have people in China who are testing Geneva. So we have uh, activists who we, it, so the, the, the short answer is yes, but the long answer is not really. Um, finding machines in these, in these places, the difficulty of that depends largely on the country. So for somewhere like Kazakhstan, it's a fairly open system, like you can just I mean, right now you can Google around for like uh, service providers in Kazakhstan. They'll just let you, you hand the money, they give you server and, and it's a great transaction. You can study the censorship system all day. And that's true in India largely too. Um, but as you pointed out, Iran and also China, this, it gets a little bit harder. Um, Iran, especially with sanctions really uh, makes it more challenging. So uh, we've, been, we've been fortunate that we've been working with a community of other uh, censorship evasion researchers who can connect us with activists who uh, kind of know what they're doing and protecting themselves. Um, so the answer is, is yes, we've worked with activists to get access to these machines. Um, the activists themselves are not running this. It's kind of like they've given us access to this machine and like, we trust you to use this hardware. And we're trusting them that the, the hardware is physically separated enough from them that if something goes wrong, it's not catastrophic. Um, so we are actually, we have enough control of what's going on that we know, uh, like someone else isn't taking our tool and misusing it. They're not like throwing up a banner that's like, please come knock on my door. Um, but we have tried to take steps to uh, a, protect these people, and um, B, only work with people who we are confident uh, can undertake that level of risk. So there's been many cases where um, students do this all the time and other people, activists in the country would be like, hey, I'm super interested in this. I want to help you. Like, please take my home computer. And we're like, oh, ooh, let's, let's talk first and, and really get an understanding of what your background is in this space. Um, so we've, we've actually turned down more people than we've said yes and thank you to in an effort to protect them. So you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a tricky thing and not everyone can just go to Iran and then do things like this. Um, but yeah, that's been something we've been working on. Thanks for clarifying that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thanks, Mark. Do, um, anyone else got any questions? Particularly, I don't know anyone that anyone else that's involved in uh, content filtering of various types uh, or just general observations. Give you a chance to uh, chime in. Right, I'm not seeing any hands raised or any other comments in the chat. So I think let, let's draw a line there then and say, uh, well, th thank you, Kevin, for a, a second run through that. And the, uh, at least as interesting as the first time, if not more so, uh, with the additional um, sort of content. Um, so that was very much appreciated. And I suspect you may well get some follow on questions after Please. the uh, call. Um, as people have a chance to absorb and think about um, the, the, the implications in various scenarios. I'll link my email and website in the chat as well. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right. And that brings us, we got sort of 10 minutes uh, before we time out. So that's actually remarkably uh, well timed. So thank you uh, for that. Um, can you unshare your screen if you wouldn't mind uh, going? Perfect. Thank you. You have the con. Yeah. Right. Let me uh, put mine uh, back on. Um, okay. So I just, uh, I can change that. Yeah. Change that to. Uh, uh, it brings us on to um, uh, any other business. Uh, so uh, just a couple of things uh, to remind you of. We've got, uh, um, apart from IGF all this week, which I suppose is a fairly important omission uh, 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 from this side. So we've got IGF running all this week, um, including what I hope will be a really interesting discussion um, just before noon uh, UTC on Thursday, um, hosted by ICANN, uh, looking at the sort of latest state of play of, uh, sort of privacy technologies as they apply to uh, DNS. So please, just please join us for that uh, uh, workshop if uh, if your diary permits. Um, uh, and then next week we've got the ICANN Resolver Operator Forum, which is uh, actually the, the agenda has expanded, so it now runs to three hours rather than the original planned two. Um, uh, with a, a, a wide variety of speakers. I won't go through them all, but you can see them on your screen. Um, so um, uh, a, a very strong and knowledgeable uh, sort of a, a group of people covering a, a variety of topics. Um, uh, also uh, on the 14th and 15th, there's the yeah, Bloomberg Tech Summit as well. Um, so we're having a look at that, see if there's anything on the agenda of interest. Uh, for this call next week, uh, we'll do... The so IGF uh, um, highlights, uh, just reprising some of the interesting stuff that's come up through um, this week. Um, and then having rapidly changed my uh, slide, um, there's a rumoured pre-Christmas carol concert that we'll be hosting on the 20th, um, which may not include any, any singing, um, because your ears will thank me um, for that, but we might just have a fairly uh, in informal uh, session then um, and then as we get sort of post uh, uh, Christmas early in the new year I'm still working on uh, Cloudflare and Google to see if we can get uh, contributors to join us to talk about uh, Cloudflare's plans for ECH um, and separately uh, Google's plans for support for Doe within uh, uh, Android 13 so uh, hopefully I'll get some progress on those um, before Christmas to so we can start some finalised dates um, that's probably, that's nearly everything for me. I've got one other thing I'll mention in a moment, but uh, has anybody got anything else that they would like to uh, highlight? Um, give you a moment to uh, either put anything in the chat or raise your hand, should you uh, wish, oh yes, uh, that's a fantastic point, Mark. I think we should task Peter to uh, implement uh, carols over DNS. That would be uh, entirely reasonable to do before uh, before the twentieth. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> so we'll uh, uh, we'll see the prototype of that uh, <laughs> running on the twentieth. Then fantastic. I'm sure there's nothing urgent uh, in your day job, Peter, that you might need to be getting. <laughs> see, thank you, Glenn. You're completely right. <laughs> now you've thought of it, it's, it's got to happen somehow. <laughs> Ah, oh, thanks. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, 
an entirely reasonable use of the DNS, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and a request feature for Delia. Perhaps we should put that as a rolling agenda item. Um, is that <laughs> request for Peter? I will add that to all future calls. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, what, what's going on? You can either go to the ITF and write uh, lengthy papers and take years <laughs> to get approval, or we can just ask Peter. I think uh, <laughs> that sounds Christmas like a much. Carols over, over DNS. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Yeah, uh, and Glenn's even put it into code. <laughs> uh, why not? <laughs> right. So, um, any other uh, any other business? So, anyone else got anything you want to highlight? I'm not seeing any hands raised or anything else uh, on there. Uh, in which case, the so one other thing I just mentioned briefly uh, is I saw last Tuesday, and apologies, I forgot to put it in the, uh, the weekly headlines, that um, uh, um, Quad9 lost it, the first round um, of its uh, uh, sort of court case um, in uh, Germany. Um, um, which I think is pretty much as expected. I'm, I'm not, I should say, I'm not expecting John to comment on this unless he wishes to. Um, uh, but uh, um, so uh, that, that will move to a higher court now um, for the, 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 the next round of that particular um, activity. And I suspect there's a number of you that will want to play, pay close attention to that to see how that plays out, because that could have implications for others should the sort of final decision as it works its way through the court system um, go in the wrong direction. Um, so that's uh, I, I'll put I'll put a, a belated link to the uh, in, to this in the uh, sort of next uh, email, but uh, that, that's as I say definitely worth people watching um, no doubt over the coming months because I'm sure it'll take a while to work through the uh, German legal system um, but uh, it was worth mentioning as I'd forgotten to put that uh, in, in the uh, headlines. Right well, in which case uh, we're just running up to time so um, thank you again Kevin for that presentation which was uh, incredibly interesting. Um, have a fantastic week, everyone. If you are in Poland, uh, enjoy that. If not, uh, do, do make time to dial into IGF if your uh, diaries are out, particularly on, on Thursday. And uh, maybe see you at one of the uh, IGF uh, workshops this week. If not, um, see you the same time uh, next week uh, for, for our call. So thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Bye, all. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Andrew. Bye.